Okay, so yeah, I'm Nick Law. Um, I'm going to be talking about goat and alpaca husbandry. Now, there's a lot to get through, so um, hopefully I'm not talking too fast for you guys and um, yeah, send the questions my way. Um, okay. So this is the agenda. So starting with goats, we've got to look at behaviour, handling, housing, nutritional needs, poisonous plants, and the common health issues that we see as vets and um, things that you can prevent. And then we'll move on to alpacas and um, a very similar thing. Um, I love talking about these guys because they're very, very cute. And I love going to see them um, out on farm. They always make my day. So basically, as an owner, you're responsible for its welfare and you're under the obligation to guarantee the following five freedoms. So freedom from hunger and thirst, providing sufficient, clean, fresh food and water. Freedom from discomfort, so providing an area of adequate shelter, either with big overhanging trees or some sort of uh, shed. Freedom from injury and disease, so protecting the animals, and if you do come across some sort of disease or if your animal's sick, calling a vet and providing rapid diagnosis and treatment. Freedom from fear and distress, so you know when handling them, making sure that um, you don't harm them or stress them out too much, and freedom to express normal behaviour. So you look in the goat's case, not tying to a short lead, um, providing something for them to jump on because they love jumping around. So goats are very, very inquisitive, intelligent creatures. They love climbing over everything. If you've got goats, you'll know that. Um, they're very social. They love spending time with their owners. Um, so providing them with heaps of cuddles and um, treats are, is the way to go. Um, here's a few fun facts, just so you know the lingo. Um, so a doe is a female goat, a buck, a male, a kid, a young goat, Kidding is giving birth and a weather is a castrated male. So starting with handling, um, very, very easy with goats. They're easy to befriend. Um, if they're young, they'll come straight to you. If you've got a bottle um, for treats, they'll just run straight up to you. It's highly recommended that you put a collar on them when they're younger because they'll get used to it and it's something to hold on to if you need to. And um, well, if your kids have got them in that for ag day, um, you need to be able to lead them anyway. Um, having some sort of pen at home is very important for restraint um, if you need to drench them or vaccinate them and things like that. Or if um, they get sick and a vet needs to see them, it's quite nice if they can be restrained at home. So moving on to housing, shelter is needed in case of rain or fair sunshine. It needs to be well ventilated um, and easy to clean. Um, so when you're in their shelters, you should better actually be put your nose down to the ground and um, it shouldn't smell of feces and things like that. It needs to be nice and clean. Um, providing shade for them is important. Um, enrichment's very important. And as a welfare point of view, um, goats love to climb express the behavior, um, allow them to actually express this behavior, um, providing drums and barrels and tree stumps and things like that to jump up on. Um, preferably untethered, so not tied up. Uh, electric fencing off the fence works extremely well, um, having those outriggers off the side of the fence. If you have deer fencing, you're very, very lucky. Um, if you have goats, you know they love to jump out of things. Um, they're more likely to stay in the paddock if they've got a mate uh, to spend time with, so another goat works well. Now, if they have to be tethered, preferably not you wouldn't, but if they have to, making sure it's long enough and that they don't have a place where they can get tangled around trees and things like that, because you don't want them to get trapped or strangled. An option that works quite well, actually, is having a clothesline um, a long straight clothesline and tying the tether to the clothesline, which allows the goat to run up and down the paddock, which yeah, works very well. Goats don't like soiled water or feed, so making sure this is checked um, regularly and changed. Moving on to nutritional needs. It's quite interesting actually. Goats eat with their lips, unlike cows that use their tongues to grab the grass. So goats don't eat close to the ground like cows and even sheep. So it's important that the grass length is over four centimetres. Now when you've got the rough summers and things like that and you do have low grass lengths, it's important to supplement them with things like nuts and hay and things like that. Um, the last point on the slide I actually show um, that 
you should offer about 2% of their live weight per day in terms of hay or some sort of roughage um, because that keeps the rumen ticking over and it allows them to absorb those nutrients. And if you do start them on nuts and things like that or any sort of grain, make sure that you introduce it very, very slowly, one handful at a time, because if you give them like a whole bucket of nuts or something like that, um, it can cause a massive gut upset, which can cause a disease known as acidosis, and this can lead um, to death. So very important to introduce it slowly. Um, goats love roses. Um, they will go nuts for them. So beware of these plants. It's the same with most species, like your alpacas are the same. You have a rapid onset of vomiting if they um, eat any of these plants. So make sure that they don't have access to any clippings or anything that you throw over the fence um, into their paddock. Um, so keep that list handy. And if um, you don't know what these plants are, uh, actually Google them so you know what they are. So moving on to common health issues. Now we see high worm burdens in goats all the time as veterinarians. Um, actually probably 80 to 90% of the time when I get called out to a sick goat, it is due to a high worm burden. Um, so you need to be drenching your goats. And I'll be talking about more of this in the alpaca section, but it, you can actually take fecal samples, take it into your vet clinic, they'll send it off and they'll tell you if they have a high worm burden. Now I've got the point here, uh, resistance. It's, you know, goats are very resistant to a lot of uh, drenches, um, unlike other species. So it's important to use a correct drench. So go and talk to your vet about that, but using a combination drench is very important. Um, most sheep drenches you can use in goats, but they need to be given two doses. Um, the second one 24 hours apart, just using the sheep um, dose rate. Now the reason we do a second dose 24 hours apart is because goats have a very, very fast metabolism and they'll metabolize any drug quickly. Um, so you need to give two doses to actually kill the worms. Now these two um, drench actives, moxidentinoclozantal, um, they kill barber's pole and they have a prolonged effect against barber's pole, um, which is the worm that sucks blood and it's very, very common in um, between January and May. So it's important to use a moxidentin or closantal drench. All your drenches, unless it's resistant, will actually kill barber's pole, but they don't have the prolonged effect. So have a look on the back of your drench bottles. Um, lameness. Now in this weather that we've been having at the moment, um, you might find that, same with uh, alpacas, goats, sheep, doesn't matter what you look at, um, a lot of foot rot problems. And if you find that your goat's limping or if they're on their knees to eat and not actually standing up, um, have a good look at the feet. And if you don't really know what you're looking for, um, get someone to come and teach you. Um, but you might notice swelling and heat around the top of the foot. Um, and if you pull the claws apart and look in between the claws, you might see uh, infected skin up there, which is foot rot. And it, you know you need to have regular trimming of the feet. And um, sometimes if it's very, very bad, they need antibiotics. So if you do have lame animals, get a vet out to come and show you and teach you how to trim them. Um, vaccinations, very, very important. The main one is five in one. Um, for your clostridial diseases, um, there's also six and one and ten and one. You can use any of them, but five and one is is fine. Um, giving them one dose and then a second dose four to six weeks later to boost them. And um, if you have any questions about vaccination um, programs and that, just talk to your vet and they'll they'll lead you in the right direction. Uh, scabby mouth is another thing that we drench our sheep with, but goats can also pick it up. Um, it's also known as off, and you'll see scabs in that around um, their feet and their mouth, and um, this is something that humans can pick up and get a bit of a rash and infection in their hands, and same with toxoplasmosis. Um, but five and one is the most important one. Not many people um, or not everyone uses you know vaccinates to get scabby mouth and toxo but um, if you have questions about these yeah again talk to your vet. Uh, vet procedures now disbudding is the biggest one so that is getting rid of the bud so they can't grow horns uh, making sure you do this very very early between two and ten days old. I know that might seem early but if you 
wait till they're older than that, you might find that the horns grow back anyway. Um, they've got very, very thin skulls and we can't burn them for long lengths of time because it can call, um, cause a lot of brain damage. So it's basically iron on and off um, and you need to do this early enough to actually kill the bud. So get that done early. Castration of the males to prevent aggressive behavior and things like that later on. Um, and then obviously vets come out and do hoof trimming and drench programs and things like that. So that was a quick run through goats. Um, we'll just move on to alpacas. They're very, very social animals. Um, they're much better in a group of other camelids. Um, they're quiet and they can be quite nervous. Now, funny facts similar to the goats, um, the adult male is a macho, an adult female is a hembra, a newborn is called a crea, and giving birth is called, cause, um, sorry, called unpacking or creating. So I'm going to start um, with this. Um, do not keep an alpaca by itself. Do not raise a crea without other camelids. Um, if you have you know, insufficient socialization with other camelids, you can have a large uh, problem. The young crea will naturally test the brown, uh, boundaries. They'll rub against you. They'll follow you, demand attention. And this is you know, often mistaken for affection, and you might think, "Oh, this is this is this is very cute. Um, this is great," but these behaviours can turn into aggression. And um, looking to the right here, um, from the Daily Telegraph, it's it's an Australian newspaper. Um, this boy was practicing rugby um, with this Korea, and every, everyone thought it was very, very cute with this um, Korea, you know, tackling this boy. But when this alpaca grows up to be 90 kilos, um, they'll be causing a lot of damage and um, can um, be very aggressive. So it's important not to spend too much time with the Korea and let the alpacas um, do the raising. So read the welfare code, very, very important. Um, you can see under the standards, number 16, that um, camelids are herd animals and that they must have a companion animal and careers must be raised in the company of other camelids. So have a good read through the welfare code. Same with goats. Um, if you know what the code is, um, you can provide um, a better home and place for them. So handling, as you can look at these pictures, um, if you look at the nasal septum, there's not much of a bony structure there. And um, so if you have an ill-fitting halter, um, you can basically suffocate your alpaca because um, if you're pulling on the lead and it's pulling down on the nasal passages, there's no bony support. Um, so make, making sure you use a proper alpaca halter that fits properly is very important. Handling, um, just having a heart arm um, encircling the middle aspect of the alpaca's neck, not too tight. Um, they will become quite stressed, but just a nice loose hold with the other hand on the shoulder works very, very well, as in the photo. Um, and when the alpacas get used to this, they um, become quite calm. Now, I've got the other point there, um, Chaka, you'll have to look it up on Google to get some images. Um, but basically, a rope is tied around the back of the alpaca and the back legs are put into that rope. Um, and then the alpaca will sit down. And because it doesn't have use of its back legs, it won't be able to stand up, which is a cool little tip. But yeah, if you look at some photos, that will help you out. So nutritional needs um, in the alpaca. Alpaca and llama are highly evolved to consume high fiber feeds and ruminate in order to process it. Um, they generally do not require a large amount and a high quality supplement feed like other animals. And they can do very, very well on low quality pasture and some hay. Um, supplementation with feeds such as pellets can become more important during things like pregnancy when the energy and protein demands increase or if your animal's in poor condition and needs to gain weight, or if um, there's low pasture due to a drought or something like that. So very similar to goats. Um, again, if you're introducing pellets, do it slowly. Don't give them a whole lot of um, food. There are ruminants just like goats, but they've actually got three stomachs instead of four. Um, that's a fun fact for you. Um, so they're actually known as pseudo-ruminants, but you're still similar to goats. Um, common health issues. Same as with goats, worm burden is a big thing. Um, facial eczema is an interesting thing, which we'll touch on shortly. 
uh, goats don't seem to have much of a problem with facial eczema and we believe it's because they don't eat so close to the ground as the other species and they also um, eat you know things up high and they like more of diversity um, so they don't they, you know they're more you know not as susceptible lameness exactly the same as goats um, in this wet weather a lot of foot problems so making sure um, you know the feet stay dry as you can obviously it's hard um, as Kate was saying a lot of her goats like to eat at the bottom of a paddock um, I don't know why animals do this but it's a lot wetter down there and um, that's when you get your foot, prob foot rot problems so important to trim them and check them regularly um, fly strike, you know, if you notice any wounds or anything on the alpacas, um, having immediate attention, um, shearing will help prevent this and um, vaccination, very important. Similar to goats, clostridial diseases with five and one or six and one. Um, from four weeks of age, then you boost to four to six weeks later. So same as with goats, um, you should vaccinate alpacas every six months, um, where goats you can get away with once a year um, with five and one. And vitamin supplements, very important, but we're gonna to touch on that shortly. So worms, um, so this covers both goats and alpacas. Take fecal samples, you can take them up to every four to six weeks if you like, to monitor worm levels. And once they're at a high level, we can drench them. That's the best way to do it because we don't wanna drench unnecessarily and cause a resistance problems because if we continue drenching um, when they don't need them, we're gonna have worms and eggs that survive the drench and um, they will get more and more resistance. So we'll end up in the future and especially on your farm um, where certain drenches won't work. Um, but I do re recommend drenching all our alpacas in December, January with an appropriate drench to prevent barber's pole because that's the worm that sucks blood and same with goats can actually cause death. So important to get that right. Um, here's a couple of drenches you can use. Um, a lot of alpaca owners will use Dectamax injections. Um, it is the dose rate for you and um, a matrix oral for sheep is another one and um, that's a combination drench so um, Dectamax is a single active um, so you might find resistance to that if you're unsure um, inject with Dectamax and then do a fecal account take it take a fecal sample into your vets 10 days later and see if um, all the worms have been killed but if you have more questions just talk to your vet Facial eczema. Now this is a North Island problem. Um, if you're in the South Island and listening, um, you can basically switch your um, ears or listening off. But it's generally seen between January to May when the soil temperature increases and there's a lot of moisture as well. So the soil temperature has to be above 12 degrees Celsius um, and there needs to be moisture. Um, signs with um, and you know facial eczema problems. Um, I bet I'll just touch on it. Actually, it's it's a fungus which affects the liver and causes liver damage, and um, it, the liver can't get rid of the chlorophyll in the grass, so this causes sun sensitivity, um, and they get a lot of sunburn and skin problems, um, just like us if we lay in the sun all day. So signs include lethargy and swollen face and ears, skin peeling off and trying to hide from the sun. So they'll be trying to seek um, shade. And alpacas are very, very susceptible to facial eczema. So you might go out and see that your alpaca has died suddenly um, with no signs at all. So you prevent this with <coughs> proper pasture management. Um, now I've done a facial eczema talk um, earlier on um, for Lifestyle Block NZ. So have a look uh, back at the facial eczema talk um, and have a listen to that, but yeah, Preventing with partial management in zinc works very well. Um, rickets, now alpacas are very susceptible to vitamin D deficiency. Um, so vitamin D is needed for calcium mobilization and having strong bones. So if they've got um, insufficient vitamin D, you have signs including abnormal leg angles in creas, so your young alpacas, or reluctance to stand due to pain. So to prevent this, <coughs> we um, year, you know, yearly to twice yearly injections with a product called Hydroject, um, which are vitamins A, D, and E, um, and giving this before um, your alpacas uh, gotta unpack. Um, so you can give it you know, five to six weeks before unpacking, or giving birth. 
Okay, here's a fact for you. Um, alpacas and llamas are very sens um, sensitive to ionophores, so do not feed calf meal to your alpacas or feeds made for other animals as you can have serious health issues and even death, so don't give them any odd meal. Make sure it's made for alpacas. Vet procedures, very similar to goats. Um, castration to help prevent the aggressive behavior in your male alpacas, uh, foot trimming, um, trimming fighting teeth, because uh, they can get quite sharp. Uh, metro checking, which um, we can do after an alpaca's given birth, making sure there's no infection or anything like that in the uterus. And then drenching, vaccinating, and um, you know, your vitamin injections and things like that. And talking to you and helping you with facial eczema prevention. So sorry, that was um, all quite a lot to take in. Um, I rushed through that nice and quickly. But yeah, we're going through questions now, aren't we, Kate? We are indeed. We are indeed. Thank you very much for that. I'll just um, remind people that because Nick is on call tonight, we're taking questions and, and right now for him. So if you do have any questions, now's the time to think about it. Um, so I've got a few. I'm just going to read out the, the um Last one that's come in, which is from Bryce Cameron, which says, what are ionophores, please? Okay, so it's a type of modified antibiotic and it's put into calf meal and things like that to um, kill cox, you know, coccidia and things like that. Right. Um, so they, they won't be put into your alpaca meal. Great, that's terrific. Uh, I've got quite a few questions on alpacas have come in. Um, somebody yes. has asked about shearing. Um, and yes. I guess that could be for goats as well. Um, is yes. it is it a, a, one of the uh, welfare code things that they have to be shorn? No, no, they don't have to be shorn. Um, I I haven't read anywhere in the code that they have to be shorn, but obviously it's got to be a lot easier to prevent any things like fly strike and things like that. It's got to be easier to prevent um, lice infestations because lice love warm coats. Mm. Um, so it's got to prevent a lot of diseases and things like that. And same with your goats. You can actually get self-shedding goats and alpacas, so look into that if you're not wanting to share them. Cool. Thank you for that. Um, somebody, it's Bryce again, has said uh, he's a goat owner and he said his um, paddocks are almost entirely kaikuyu and clover. What's the issue with kaikuyu? And I have to, we've got kaikuyu up here too. So um, the goats do, it hasn't killed them yet. Touch wood. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So kaikuyu, we would see a lot lower on the list. So the vet, it's sort of in a, um, order of how toxic it is and they have to eat a lot of kaikuyu um, for them to start vomiting and things like that um, so unless your paddocks are full kaikuyu um, you shouldn't have too much of an issue um, but I wouldn't um, yeah feed them heaps of it yeah I mean, I mean yeah up here in Northland it's about the only thing that grows through the summer when it gets dry and hot unfortunately <laughs> but yes that's great thank you yeah. for that um another question here from Sue uh, she's actually sent a couple of questions which I'll, I'll give you at the same time so first of all how many females can one macho serve um that's uh, actually a very good question and I don't know the answer off the top of my head um in that I'd have to get back to you on that okay. um but you, norm you normally see one, um, I see, you know, alpacas with quite a few. Like, if you look at cows and that, they, they can serve up to 30 animals. So I'm, I wouldn't think marchers are much different, um, but I'd have to look into that. And it looks like our um, nine-month-old buck that we used this year, or a young boy, has managed to get all 27 girls in, in um, kids. So, yeah. Oh, good. That's how, that's how it works with goats. Um, okay, now... <laughs> yeah, he's a good lad. Um, so <laughs> the, the other question we had from Sue has also just been... Um, is almost the same as one that Jane has just sent in, which is just wondering about running alpaca and goats together. They've been uh, Jane says she's been warned not to do so, but they seem very interested in, in each other. Is it just to do with the worm burden issue? Yes, a lot of it um, is to do with worm burdens. Um, they do share, they're both ruminants, so they do share some of the worms, um, but as species, they should get on well together. Like I've seen alpacas running with miniature ponies and stuff before and they love each other. Um, so I don't see a huge problem with running goats in terms of behavior. Um, but yeah, a lot of it comes down to worms. You can actually use horses, which works quite well, actually running behind your goats and alpacas because they don't share the same worms. So they actually mop up a lot of the worms for you, which is a good pasture management um, tip. Um, 
but yeah, I don't see anything wrong behaviourally running the two together. Yeah, I mean, they, they do like different, as you, well, I mean, obviously alpaca can eat longer grass, but certainly, um, yeah, I, I don't like it when I see cattle and goats together on very short pastures, because as you say, that's not how goats eat, and I know that's not how goats yes. eat, so maybe that's yes, another exactly. reason. Um, okay, thank you for that. Cross that one off. Um, another question from Bryce here. Um, what is a vet pr profession doing anything to get more drugs on label for goats? Um, because he's obviously got the problem we all of us goats owners have, which is everything's off label. I know it's the same with our packers. It's actually a headache for us because people come in and they say, "What can we use in our our packer and goat?" And we're like, um, "Let me look into it for you." Because yeah, basically we're just going off research from the states and that. And I don't know what the overall profession is doing about that, um, but goats. So especially goats, they become resistant to things so quickly that everything's changing constantly um, because they metabolise things so quickly and become resistant so fast. So it's becoming a problem. So, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what the whole profession as a whole is doing on that. I think every single goat, um, everything, every single vet I've ever spoken to has told me a different um, strategy for drenching. So what we actually do is drench at about one and a half times the um, sheep dose yep. every two yep. days so if, and repeat it in 48 hours which as you I mean it's just it, it's all kind of not quite guesswork but we're just trying to stop resistance and um is it Exactly. And that's why doing your fecal egg counts can be quite yeah. good um, because you don't want to drench unnecessarily. Yeah, um, we do our own here and that's quite cool. Right. Um, awesome. Something from Jan here saying lots of people have tell her it's difficult um, to for the creer. Sorry, for the. What did she say? Sorry, I'm just going to read this again. It's difficult to keep the creer. Oh, I think she's talking about pregnancies. Um, yeah, to keep the creer um, and not lose them. Is there anything you can do about that? I think she's talking about pregnancies. What do you mean? Are you talking about losing abortion, like aborting I'm Korea? So I have heard myself as well that that um, most a lot of pregnancies of um, alpaca don't actually come to fruition. Mm. I guess that's what she's talking about. Well, it's um, just very, very important to provide the necessary energy. Um, so getting them onto some sort of pallet and that for extra energy, making sure there's nothing like macrocarpa or anything available to the alpaca in your paddocks because obviously that causes abortion. Mm -hmm. um, so just making sure you know your plants and that very, very well around the area and providing yeah, providing a lot of uh, feed and making sure they're in good body condition because if, if your alpaca is um, quite light um, the first thing they're going to do is lose the fetus um, to basically it's a survival instinct to save themselves so um, just getting everything right but yeah it can it can be very very frustrating um, because as uh, it depends as well if they're actually being scanned pregnant or not um, because you might find that um, the macho is actually shooting blanks as well if she's not getting pregnant um, in the first place. So that's another thing to look at as well. Okay, cool. And she has just emailed me, to, uh, messaged me to say that, yeah, that was what she meant. It was just a bit of a typo okay. in her question. Right, I've got two more. Um, one from Janet who's asking, what age do alpacas live to? Um, they can live for a long time, if I'm not mistaken, like 30 years, but um, wow. probably better just to Google that, Google, Google that one, um, because I don't know off the top of my head to be exact. Cool. And there's one from another one from Bryce, who, as I say, is also obviously a goat farmer. And um, what's your thinking of bringing new goats into mobs and the stress it causes? Um, I just like to point out every... that bringing a bucket never causes stress to my goats, <coughs> but that's okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I think the most and like bringing new ones is well, you've done it a lot, haven't you, Kate? There's not a huge amount of stress in itself, um, but it's very important to think about everything else in terms of having some sort of um, sacrifice paddock or some sort of keeping them in one little paddock and drenching them and everything first before you put everything onto your farm um, and bringing another problem in. But um, have you noticed anything, Kate, in terms of to be stress honest, of bringing um, other goats in? One thing I would recommend to anybody who's going to keep goats as we do is um, that we I actually have a closed herd um, I, and I would do the same if I had cattle uh, well I do have a few cattle but a closed herd in that we don't bring in a lot of animals we bring in a buck um, every couple of years but yeah we, we don't everything I've got here we started with 26 does and uh, 
the 26 goats and i think we've now got 150 something <laughs> and they're all born yeah, here yeah, yeah, and that's that's an awesome way of doing it because you're not bringing in disease or anything as well. I've actually just um, googled the life expectancy, and it's about twenty years in our packers. Wow. My um, good my good googling skills for you all. Perfect. Thank you for that. It's always good. Uh, <laughs> right. Sorry, I've got another question that's come in late asking about water belly and goats. Um, yes. Now it's something that we see occasionally here after shearing and at odd times. Um, uh, Bryce is asking, what's the current thinking about cause and treatment? Good question about cause because um, no one really knows. Like we see it in all species. I sort of actually carved um, a couple of cows this season with water belly. Wow. Um, yeah, and you know it, you can't really tr or treat. You know, treatments an interesting thing. You can't really. Um, you get like um, yeah. I don't really know how to answer any more than that. To be honest, have you have you seen it quite a bit out there or? Um, well, I don't know about Bryce, but certainly up here we get it occasionally after shearing, and it has been suggested to us that maybe you just can't see it before shearing, because of course angoras have got such a long fleece. But no, it's something mm. it's not present at shearing, but it will be present a couple of days later. Usually the smaller kids, um, and we have well from the research that I've done, it's one suggestion has been that it's it's to do with a drop in protein, um, and so what we tend to do is give some. Um, Vigest, so it's additional feed and Vigest, and, and it goes away quite quickly. Vigest is a wonderful product. I'm not paid to advertise it, but get some. It keeps, <laughs> keeps animals alive. It's brilliant. It's got lots of vitamins and lots of um, minerals and things and, and energy. And uh, yeah, we, we I dose my kids with that. So hopefully that will help. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, or just, any, any, yep. Sorry. Uh, no, somebody, uh, Robin's just come in and asked, what are the symptoms of water belly? Um, so. I'm happy to say the symptoms of water belly. Yeah, it's just a big swelling under the goat's belly. <laughs> yeah, and it can also, if it's really bad, it will be around the, the ankles and under the chin as well, because basically it's lymph yeah. fluid, I believe, that just drains. And of course, it goes to the lowest possible points. So they have a. Yeah, it's, a also, of... yeah, it's also known as edema. So it's just That's pulling right. of fluid. Um, due to, as Kate said, loss of protein. Um, so the protein holds the fluid inside all the vessels in the lymph. Yeah. Um, so as soon as you've got a lack of protein, um, water travels from high solute, uh, low solute to high solute. So if the solute's higher outside the vessels in the lymph, it's got to travel out into under the skin. So that's why you get all your pulling the fluid. Um, it looks pretty pretty horrible and scary. And if their legs sort of, if they get it badly in their legs, their, their ankles swell up like balloons. It's quite horrible. We've only had that a couple of times when it's been that bad. Right, I think that is all of the questions we have for you. And I've just got one comment to make on what you said. Oh, two comments to make. One is um, don't dehorn angoras. We need their horns, they're quite useful. And if you do, yep. if you're not gonna dehorn your animals, don't put collars on them, I don't think, because they get caught. <laughs> In other, yes. other goats' horns, that can be a nightmare. We've had that once where somebody gave and, Yeah, and you can restrain them quite well using their horns so you don't need the collar as much uh, when they've got the horns. Yeah. yeah. And the last thing is if, if – I just want to comment that if goats don't like soiled water and feed, they should stop treading on their food. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a very good point. Um, they do love jumping into trays of food, don't they? Oh, yes, they do. <laughs> Little horrors, they really are. Anyway, no, so thank you very much uh, for that, Nick. Um, I don't know if you're going to be able no to problem. stick around or not, but um, yeah, thanks very much. And I think we should recommend that everybody gets goats because they're wonderful. They are cute. Yeah. They're the best. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks very much, Nick. Cool, thanks, Kate.